What is up heroes, this is Midnight Zero, and welcome back to Let's Play Professor Layton in the Curious Village Blind. In this bonus episode, we are going to take on the Golden Apple's house. I looked a little bit at the puzzles in the last episode, and the titles seemed pretty interesting. I'm pretty excited to give them a go, and I hope you guys are excited to see them as well. I know that these are some really challenging puzzles, so this may be a little bit of a longer episode, but, but we shall see, right? Um, I mean, they've been ranging anywhere from half an hour to 45 minutes so far, and it's just really to complete two or three puzzles. That said, um, I am proud of the progress we've made, and I, again, would like to say that I'm really glad they included these. Uh, this is like, you know, a great example of bonus content for people that enjoyed this type of game, so. Okay, let's hop into puzzle number 130, Too Many Queens, number 5. I'm really excited for this one because I actually really liked all the other Queens ones. So, whoa, 99 Picarats? 99? In chess, the queen can move the full length of the board diagonally, vertically, and horizontally. So here we are, this is the big one. <laughs> See if you can place eight queens on this eight by eight chess board. The rules are the same as before. Don't let any piece block another's line of movement. Wow, and so it's truly just open. <laughs> I love it. So here we are, this is the big one. All right, well, um, gosh, where do we even start? I'll start by placing one here and seeing where we, and then just kind of proceeding row by row. I think a general good place is uh, kind of these second spaces from the edge, for the time being at least. I think it would be nice, or it, it would at least be helpful if it highlighted tiles that were being actively, you know, taken up. Um, so that you could see whether or not you are completely precluding any row from having, you know, an answer, or like a possible choice. But I think what we'll want to do is, so with each queen, for example, in this top row, it has, you know, this diagonal, this vertical, and then another diagonal. I think what we'll want to do is try to kind of slip each queen into the first space between that vertical and diagonal. So maybe, I mean, we'll eventually probably end up with one on that side. But for now, we'll we'll do this. And then we could probably place another one here if we wanted. And that would be okay. And then, similarly on this side, this would not work, but this would. So we'll do that. And then, here we could do this. Or do I want to do this one? I'll do this one for now. And then over here, actually we only have two columns left, so that's not going to work. Yeah, pretty much no matter what we do. Because the two columns we have remaining are, are so close together, and because we have two rows coming close together, uh, we'll obviously end up within a 2x2 two two area, so we we're pretty close, but but not quite. Because this would be where we'd have to place the last one and that would not work. So what do we know? Um, we know that whatever, whenever, if we're going row by row and placing them like we just did, we need to do so in such a way that the remaining two, or the last two pieces aren't in the same two uh, columns, or aren't in like two columns next to each other. We need to kind of space it out differently. So that's good to know. And in fact, so for example, if I were to go here, um, oh, I actually couldn't even go here, uh, but if I were to go here, the two columns need to actually be more than one column away from each other in order for this to work. So that, too, is really important. Which means... Okay, so so we're doing some, some deduction here, right? So if we need two columns at the end, basically, if we're going row by row, in such a way that there's at least one column between the two of them, we really need to have two columns. Because, no matter what, one of them would have to be within the diagonal of the preceding row. 
And then, if we know we're going to need two columns next to each other that have uh, queens in them, they cannot be within one row of each other, at least. Yeah. Alright, so... So let's start again. I'm sure there are multiple solutions here. So let's think through this again. Again, we want to we want to save our last two into two columns that are not going to be next to each other. And ideally have two spots apart. So we can construct that or we can construct this next board with that in mind. Wow, 90 99 pick rats. Unbelievable. Um so so far we're we're doing just that. We're kind of going along this diagonal pattern where we just place the next queen in the next row immediately outside the range of the uh, prior queen. So we'd be continuing to do so, like so. Um, now we're going to want to start to place a couple in the middle areas if we can. So this would work. And now, again, two of our columns, which are we going to need to do? We're going to need to save... We have three columns left and we have three rows left, right? But again, we're trying to keep it so that the last two rows we fill in, those queens are in columns that are more than two columns apart. So the next one I'm going to want to place in the, uh, I guess like the sixth column. However, I can't do that because of this queen here. So what I'm going to do is instead move this queen over there and then I'll actually have the flexibility to, in the next row, place it in the fourth column, and that way I've constructed it so that there are two columns that are quite a bit far apart for this final row. So now the question is, where do we go from here? Um, and it can't be here because that diagonal, or that bottom right corner is taken. So let's, ah, yeah, we're not gonna, we're not gonna be able to, because that's going to overlap with this guy here. Darn. So we were close. We were close. At least closer. <laughs> um, trying to, I guess, garner some sort of, some set of rules to go by that, that will lead us in the right direction. Um, so that was one step in the right direction, setting it up so the last two rows are in columns that are quite a bit farther apart. Um, however, how can we create this in such a way that well, I guess, let's see, where was, where is the final open space? It's here, when you look at diagonals. Um, because every other spot, almost every other spot, this one does not, for example, have a diagonal. Um, so which diagonals are going to matter in this last row? It's only going to be the final three before it, final four, maybe five or six, but, oh, and possibly, it depends on how far to the left or right they are, obviously. So, so what would be another strategy then? Basically, we need the column for our very last queen placement. We need that column to also ha not have any diagonals attached to it. Meaning, there's always one column that will be left behind, right? However, I need that to also not be taken up by any diagonals. Meaning, how can I plan that? How can I plan that to happen? I think the only way that I can do that 100% is to rely on the corner. Yeah, I think the only way I do that is if the last queen goes in a corner. Maybe not the only way, but I guess what I'm thinking of. I'm sure there are multiple solutions. But, um, and if that's the case, I need to ensure that this top row queen is not in the corner, as it is not currently. 
So let's let's work backwards almost from that. So let's take these guys back and say, okay, our last row is going to be in a, a column that also has a diagonal that's free. So where can we go from here? We can go, you know, any of these four. Actually, I should remove this last one and just try to build in such a way that that's the case. Hmm. Again, we're still trying to maintain so those last two columns are far apart. Now, I'm trying to decide where along this row should I go? I'm going to want to stick towards the middle. If I'm going to have to save the last row, it needs to be a column in a corner spot. By putting it here, I would be ruling out the spot on the right. So I don't necessarily want to do that just yet. Um, and I obviously would rule it out with this. So I'm really picking between these three spots here. And I'm trying to think in terms of what's, what tiles am I ruling out close to the center of the board? Am I, am I forcing something into being uh, only available, the only tile available being on the, you know, the far left column or the far right column, and thus taking out one of those diagonals? Because I want to avoid doing that as much as possible. So I think for the time being, we'll, we'll place it here and see how it goes from there. So again, looking at things, um, this is not available, but this tile is, and then this tile as well. I think I'm gonna go with this one this time. And we are building a bit of a density on the right side of the board, so naturally we're gonna start moving to the left. Um, we could go here, and we'll do that for now to avoid you know, getting that far left or far right for the time being. We are, of course, also keeping in mind, keeping in mind where we want our last two uh, queen's rows to be, right? We, you know, when we're filling out those final two rows, we want the columns we're filling in to not be too close together. So next up, let's again stick towards the center. Although going here rules out one of the diagonals. It's an inevitability at some point. Although we've already ruled out one of the diagonals with this queen up here. So I'm gonna want to avoid this spot, actually. And instead I'm gonna go here, because that far left diagonal, bottom left diagonal, or bottom left corner tile is already ruled out. So now we only have three options left, and this is not one such option, and this is not one as well. Well, this one on the left is not, and then um, this one is not because of this diagonal up here. But if we go in this far right corner, we'll be ruled out. However, it may actually not be necessary. Just taking a look at things. We have this column here, and we have this column here. We cannot go in this column. So we would have to be here, and then we could go here. And I think that actually works. Let's take a look. So this top queen, uh, it has nothing on the diagonals, nothing vertical, nothing horizontal. Second row, it, <laughs> it has two. It has two queens in its diagonals. So this does not work, unfortunately. Um, are there two that I could switch that would make things more effective? Not that I can see easily, at least. I'm trying to think in terms of like some sort of swap we could make that would fix things sort of by switching positions. Does this work? No, it doesn't because of that guy all the way up there. But what if we did something like this? It's always gonna require a swap in pairs. 
Oh no, this doesn't work. That just kind of mirrored it, didn't it? Yeah, so that didn't that didn't quite work. Hmm. Something else worth considering is that we could try to open up center tiles in that final row by having the most central, as in, you know, columns three, four, five, six, be higher up, you know, further, like some of the, you know, first rows towards the top of the board. That way their diagonals will eventually, you know, be far more spread out. And then, of course, if the queens towards the bottom of the board are more lateral, um, you know, towards the left and right, their diagonals won't extend into the center as much. However, we'll probably have already used... Okay, so let's... <laughs> let's try and establish some queens closer to the center towards these top rows while, main, while leaving one of the center columns open. Like such. And then we can start to extend a bit more laterally. Where can we go next? We cannot go there, so then we would have to use our, our central one, which is not good. Um, so what can I do to fix that? Is there a different spot I could have gone here? Could I make a different center slot open? I can with that. Does that still leave this available? It does. Okay, so I think this is looking a little bit healthier. Will this work? It will there. Now, have we left that center slot open? I think we have. Yeah. Let's let's check this, because I actually, I, at first glance, I think this might work, but... Um, so this queen, nothing in the diagonals, nothing in the row, nothing in the column. This queen has nothing in the row, nothing in the column, nothing in the diagonals. This has nothing in the diagonals, row, or column. This has nothing in the diagonals, row, or column. This has nothing in the diagonals, row, or column. Nothing in the diagonals, row, or column. Nothing in the diagonals, row, or column. And then nothing in the diagonals, rows, or column. Wow, so we got it. So that was, that was the logic that led to it towards the end there. The, the need for... Well, columns being at least two spaces apart, if you're going through, going about constructing the board um, by row, so that you have two rows, two consecutive rows towards the end, um, those columns need to be at least a couple apart, so constructing, you know, in such a way that we do that. But then also trying to preserve some of the central tiles by having the more centered queens in terms of the columns. Uh, be in the earlier rows and then the more lateral queens in the later rows so that their diagonals are less likely to take up that central area and and here we are um, yeah I, unless I'm missing something just overlooking something I think I think this is it well here's my guess all right Yes! I like that one. <laughs> you finally worked your way up to an official size chessboard, 8x8. Because this classic puzzle requires a solver to place 8 queens, it's known as the 8 queens puzzle. If you consider rotations and mirrored solutions as separate answers, there are 92 answers to this puzzle. Without any of the above factors, there are only 12. Gotcha. Really interesting. Terrific. Keep up the good work. That was really fun. Um, I'm not, not surprised, because I liked all of the queens puzzles leading up to this point, but that was... that was solid um just in terms of kind of understanding how the queens interact with each other and dedu like deducing some sort of logic right some sort of set of rules to guide your construction of the boards and then learning from them and then trying again really cool stuff okay another 99 pick wrap puzzle below are 12 weights that are visually identical to one another among these is a single weight that has a different weight you don't know if it's lighter or heavier the problem is that you don't know whether this weight is heavier or lighter than the others. Use the scales exactly three times to determine which weight is different from the others. 
exactly three times. <sighs> All right. So, so how would we want to do this? Um, would you just kind of iterate the same process as before? Where, for example, you were to put one and then two, three, four. I'm just going to use my mouse <laughs> rather than the touchpad. Six, seven, eight. So you put all of these in this manner. And then one side will be lighter or heavier, right? Oh, you don't even know. But you don't know if it's lighter or heavier. So you don't know which side to sort of sample afterwards. I guess... Oh, and you only have three, right? I feel like this is still the first step no matter what. I'm trying to think if you had some uneven amount, right? Um, we don't even know if the one that does weigh different from the others weighs like a multiple of them. So it's not even to say that, oh, five weights on one side would balance out with, um, if one of those five is heavier, it would balance out with seven weights on the other side. So I ultimately think that the first step is putting, you know, six and six and seeing that there is a balance, a, a difference between two of them. However, because we don't know if it's lighter or, or heavier, I don't think that really changes much, right? Um, just in terms of, you're still just going to take one of those sets of six from the scale. You don't know if it, which it, whichever is relevant, if it's the lighter one or the heavier one, though. And then amongst those six, you're probably going to split them up into three and three and see if they weigh the same. And if they weigh the same, then you know none of all of those are the same weight. So I think you don't even need to split them up six and six in the beginning anyways. I think you can just right off the bat jump to, to testing the sets of six in three by three. So let's do that with the first three or the first six. So actually I should just do this. Um, so for example, I could do this and see they're the same. So we don't need to worry about those. And instead, now the six remaining, the seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, those are the ones that are going to have the odd one. So now we say, okay, let's split these up into three by three, like so. And then after we weigh this, we'll be able to say, okay, one of them, well, can we say that 100%? One of them will be lighter and one of them will be heavier. But that doesn't really tell us much, right? Because we still don't know if the weight's heavy or not. So now I think we actually go maybe pair by pair. Yeah, I think we actually do something like this. Where we do like seven, eight, and then, or I should just, for the sake of keeping track of things. Um, seven, eight, and then nine and 10. Because if you were to do three and three, one would be lighter and one would be heavier, but that wouldn't tell you, you know, which subset you would then test again. Because you would then, if it were, if we knew we were looking for the heavier one, um, we would take whatever heavy side and then we would weigh um, two of them, like one of them against the other. And if they were normal, the third one is the odd one. The odd one out is the heavy one. And of course, whichever one, if they weren't the same, whichever would, would be heavier would be the, the one that weighed differently. So I don't think actually weighing the three against the three would even help us. So instead, we're gonna start by kind of narrowing it down this way, where if we take two and two like so, if they're the same, if they're normal, um, they, they balance each other out, then we know it's between 11 and 12 and we can weigh them accordingly. However, now if one of them is lighter or heavier, what we can do is, well, Hmm, that still wouldn't really help much, right? In the sense that we wouldn't know which of the two sets of two would have the problematic one. It only is helpful if they weigh the same. Hmm. 
Hmm. So, would we go... I haven't quite gotten to the point where I feel like there's a solid method. But the first time I did a puzzle like this, I didn't see that method. But the comments, you guys pointed it out. Um, so I am prone to missing that. So I'm trying to think, okay, what would be a reliable method that no matter which weight it is, um, we would be able to find it every single time if we just applied this process. I feel like it's gotta be, the three and three wouldn't tell us much, the two and two wouldn't tell us much. What about the one and one? Right? What if we just compared like seven to eight? If they're normal, that's good. Um, but but then we wouldn't be able to tell between the remaining four. But just like comparing the 6 to 6, I don't really think... Hmm. It would be that helpful to compare 3 to 3 as the second step at this point. But maybe that is the case. I'm just thinking, you know, what if, what if they're not the same, right? And they won't be the same, actually. I know for a fact they won't be the same because one of the weights is hidden among them. So it, it's no use to, it's not helpful at all to weigh them. I know that they're going to be, um, I know that it's going to not be normal, right? It's not going to be even. So the question then is, what other test could I do that would be helpful? And I feel like, so it's definitely not the measuring three against three. And I think, so we obviously get our answer if these were to weigh and be normal, right? But what if they're not? What if they're not? Then you would say, oh, one of them is off, right? One of them is either lighter or one of them is, is heavier. You don't really know which one. So then I think, I think after that, I mean, you would have to take one of the sets of two, one of the pairs and weigh them against each other. If they're normal though, you know that one of the weights in the pair you didn't test is the abnormal one, but you don't know which one. Right? And that's why I'm not 100% confident in this method. So maybe the goal is to, to rule out more from the beginning. So what if we measured four by four? Or four against four? I think this may be more efficient because we can break it down into the pairs better. So if we weigh this, we know that the remaining four, 9, 10, 11, 12, are normal. So now we would take one of these sets of four, let's say the numbers one through four, and we would have to go two by two. Oh, I feel like we still run into the same problem, admittedly. These are normal, yep. So so now we know it's between six, five, seven, and eight, um, but we don't know which of them it's going to be, and we only have the opportunity to measure you know, one against the other. So, so I could do something like, oh, it's six versus five, and they're the same, so we don't know which between seven and eight it is. 
and we have a 50-50 shot at that point. So that's not the surefire methodology. And it can't be starting off by measuring two against two, because if it were the third one, you wouldn't know which, which it is. You would still be guessing between the two. And it's not going to be like five against five. Yeah, it's important that we don't know how much lighter or heavier it is. Um, because then we can't rely on it being, you know, ex worth the weight of two, for example. So yeah, it, it wouldn't be five against five either, because if you were to do that, um, what would happen? Well, if they were normal, for example, you could easily figure out between the remaining two, but if they're different, um, then what, right? And then you take one of the groups of five and measure two against three or, or two against two. If they're normal, you don't know if that remaining one is normal as well. So that's definitely not it. So you either start, unless there's something I'm missing, with me by measuring three against three or four against four. Although we just tried four against four, and I don't, I didn't, I didn't like it. <laughs> but we ran into the same problem we did with three against three. I don't think six against six would be helpful because we know one side is going to be uh, heavier than the other. So it's gotta be, in my opinion, three against four and obviously going one by one is not effective. So I think I'm gonna go back to the idea of measuring three against three. So after we've done this, okay. So we know that the remaining six are normal. Basically, if we do this, we, we, we are able to rule out six. So now we have two sets of three. The thing is we don't know whether the weight is heavier or lighter, right? So we don't know which of these sets of three it could be. So what do we measure next? From those first six, what do we measure next? Hmm. Oh, this is creative. I think I see it. I think I see the solution. So, What's interesting is I was stuck in the mindset of, okay, we now know it's within, one within this group. And so then I was only thinking in terms of how do I measure these weights against each other within this group to figure it out. But we can actually utilize that information that we know the other six are normal. So we split this uh, these first six into two groups, right? One, two, three, and then four, five, six. Now what we do is we take one of those groups and measure it against a set of three that we know will weigh normal. So like seven, eight, nine, for example. Yeah, and so after we've done this, we can confirm whether or not the weight is within one, two, three or not. So for example, let's say these weigh exactly, they balance out, um, perfect then we know it's within four, five, and six, and then we measure one of that set of three against the other and we're able to figure it out. That's, that's how you do it. So we know that it's amongst one, two, and three, so all we need to do then is say, okay, let's measure, um, let's measure one against two. And we know, oh, but now we don't know which one. We don't know which one because we don't know if it's heavier or lighter, right? But we know it's either one or two. <laughs> um, oh, we're so close. 
We know it's either one or two, and so we're again left with that 50-50. So we'll restart. But I think we're on the right track, where we start this off, you know, doing our one, two, three, four, five, six, measuring three against three, and finding out are those normal or not? Okay, and so they are normal. So we know that our our off weight is within seven through twelve. The question is, yeah. So I, I like the idea of measuring the three against the three. Hmm. But yeah, even if if you're left at a point where the scale tips and both of the weights are potential unknowns, you don't know, weighing doesn't help um, because you don't know what it could be. Um, hmm. So now what? Now that we know we have six normal, The first six are normal weights, and our off one is from 7 to 12. What we're going to have to do, we're going to have to figure it out by measuring against knowns. So I like the idea still of 7, 8, 9, you know, measuring against stuff we know is um, either normal weight or not. So these are normal, meaning 10, 11, 12 have the odd weight out. That sound effect though, am I right? So we know the weights within 10, 11, 12. So... Hmm... Maybe we need to... Actually, I, th I feel like... I feel like we need to do it with fours. I feel like we need to do it with fours. I think that's the way to go. Because I'm trying to think, if you break it down into, you know, a group of six, right? You're gonna have to split it again into, you know, three and three. And then within that three, if you're gonna have to measure it against something else, you're either gonna be left with a set of two, um, or there's a possibility that it could be, you know, one of the pairs that you test against the, a normal pair, but then you're left with a 50-50 at the end. So I think what we actually need to do is have a set of four that we're able to test against a normal pair of fours. So then we can jump straight to the, oh, now we can then test a pair and then we can test a single one. So if we do something like this, we know these are normal, right? So nine, 10, 11, and 12 are the ones that are off. So obviously, um, well now we can move to the point of pairs and then we've narrowed it down to a pair that could be abnormal or not. And then we can measure them against each other. So, 9 and 10, for example, we could measure against 7 and 8, which we know will be normal. Right? Is this the, is this the proper next step? Yeah, yeah, it is. So, now we know that it's, um, one of these two. So 11 and 12 are normal weights, and 7 and 8 are normal weights. So 9 and 10 are the ones that are abnormal. So now we measure one of those against a normal one. Right? So we'll measure 7 against 9, for example. And we know that 7 is normal, so 9 must be the abnormal one. So again, we're narrowing it down from 4 to 2 to 1. And the idea was, before when we were splitting up into six and six, what we could do is narrow it down to, oh, now we can you know, compare groups of three if we wanted, or you know, a group of four. But with each time you're, you're comparing in that way, it's most efficient to, to narrow it down to the next group being half of the original group you tested. That's the most efficient way to rule things out. Um, so that's why it was, you know, six to three, and then within that we had the option of doing two or one, but we were left with a 50-50. So that's why when we jump to four, 
again, we're still able to, because we have 12, um, to test a group of four against either one of the groups of four we initially had. So we're really utilizing that first way as much as we can. And then from within that four, we're then able to go to two and then down to one. So I think this is the method. It's always four by four and then, um, and then from within that group that has the bad or the off weight, you take two and measure them against two normals and that will narrow it down to two more. And then from within the two that you know have the off weight, you measure one of those against a regular one and that'll tell you whether it's normal or not. And then by default, you can figure out what the other one is. So yeah. How does this sound? Wow, that was, um, that was really cool. That was really cool, actually. I, I like that one a lot. That's correct. This challenging problem is well known to many puzzle aficionados. If you're lucky, it's possible to find the answer without too much work. Think of how you could do this if you could use the scale as many times as you wanted. Interesting. Nicely done. I knew you could do it. Thank you for your confidence, Professor Layton. But yeah, that was that was a fun one. That, again, that was one that was really cool to reason to, or reason through. Um, just in terms of how are we able to actually utilize our resources how are we able to narrow things down as efficiently as possible? Um, it was really neat. Okay, so now, puzzle number 132, Princess in a Box 2. Why don't you give it a try? Oh, give it a try, I will, Professor. 80 pick rats? After doing two 99 pick rat puzzles? So this is very similar, but not quite the same. If I recall correctly, there was only one purple block last time. And, oh man, this was a tough one. Okay. Tired of leading a sheltered life, this princess is trying to escape her castle. Armed guards, however, are blocking her path. Slide the blocks out of the way to move the red one out the exit to the right. Her freedom depends on you. Can you do it? Okay, again, the symmetry is striking. Um, how are we going to be able to move the red block? Well, we need to we need to be able to shift it forward. And the way I like to think about it is in terms of there are two open blocks right now. I need to shift the blocks in such a way that that those two open blocks are, I guess, in the perimeter of the uh, of the red block. However, when I move the red block and thus create two more blocks, I need to do so in such a way that the remaining blocks can utilize that space. And that's the tough part. So let's start by doing this. Now the question is, do I want to close the, the green blocks around here, or the, the purple? I think I'm going to go with purple, actually. Hmm, I could have done that more efficiently. But, um, so again, what I could do here, actually, I'm going to restart for the sake of, just because I care about my move counter too much. Um, I can move this here like that. So I can bring this up and this down. And again, I can utilize this space with the blocks I currently have. So the question is, how do I want to do that? Do I want to, do I want to move the blue block? Or do I want to move the, the purple blocks? Well, if I'm going to want to be creating space in front of the, the red block again, how am I going to do that? I'm eventually going to need to move this blue block in front of me out of the way. So I am going to have to create space um, for that blue block in the lower right corner to, to move. So, so what we'll do is this for now, so that we can shift these purple blocks over, like so. And then we can do what? We can shift these guys up so that this is able to move forward, this is able to move forward, this is able to move forward and we're able to bring again the red block forward and again we're trying to utilize the space in such a way that our, our guys will always be able to move however we've failed <laughs> we have failed in doing so so where do we go wrong that was not the correct move Hmm.
I guess I need to... I need to make the top half of the puzzle more flexible. So let's try moving some of these purple blocks over. And then with that, I can move this blue block. But that's also not going to be helpful, unfortunately. <laughs> because I can't move the, uh, the blue block off to the right, unfortunately. Um... So we moved one of those down, and then we moved it to the side. All right, let's let's get creative for a moment and just kind of mess around a little bit. What if I were to move partially? Like so. Mm, that's not particularly helpful, is it? Because at this point, the only thing that can utilize this space is just moving the red block back to the uh, <laughs> back to the beginning position. Which is obviously not ideal, so we're basically undoing things at this point. Hmm. same position as before, where there's not much I can do. So we'll restart. Darn, that second purple block. <laughs> that second purple block is proving to be quite troublesome. Hmm. How are we going to want to do this? So... The first move has to be moving one of these green blocks to allow one of the purple blocks to move. Because of the symmetry, it shouldn't matter which one it is. So this is the first fork in the road. So the question is, do we bring up the purple block or do we move potentially the blue block? I could move the blue block in order to utilize this space as such. The question is, now what? Do I bring this blue block further up and then fill in that space with the with the greens? I'm going to I'm going to th think so. So let's do this for now. Although this I'm pretty sure is incredibly similar to the situation we were just in. So creating space for the blue block at the top of the screen is not productive. I need to be able to move that purple block out of the way. So if I'm going to do that, I need to create space for it to do so. But that's still just going to end up in the same situation I was at before. So let's see if I can do something different by maybe bringing this up here. And I need to create some flexibility around that blue block on the left. Do 
I'm able to create space to push the red block forward, but every time I do that, I'm gonna be left with two slots behind it, on the far left of the puzzle, that are completely inaccessible because I won't be able to move that blue block. On the left, that is. Let's see, let's rotate this around. I should have left this blue block close to the, the top of the screen because if I bring these around, I can, I can then utilize that space after I push the red block forward. Like so. So now the question becomes, what do I do from here? Do I move that blue block forward or do I keep that space occupied by greens? I think I'm gonna try and keep it occupied by greens for now because they tend to be more flexible. Although here's an interesting opportunity. <laughs> do I shift the, the red block down? I feel like it's gonna be more difficult to maneuver from the center, so I'm not tempted, I'm not too keen on it right now. But that would mean that if I wanted to progress, I would need to move that blue block in the top right corner out of the way of the red block. And doing so is impossible, I think, right now. Because if I move this green that I, um, this lone green, <laughs> so that I can move the purple block to the left, I can occupy that space to some degree, but I can never bring that blue block more than one row, one block unit, towards the bottom of the screen. And as soon as I do that, that the two open blocks are no longer, you know, um, useful to anything. So, so that can't be the case. So let's bring this down here and try to move this out of the way for the time being. And we're gonna want to... Ooh, how are we gonna wanna settle this? Um, we're gonna wanna utilize the green blocks as much as we can for their motility. So I think what we'll want to do is this for now. So that we can kind of slide that out of the way and, again, try to cover or surround the red block with as many green blocks as possible so that we can really utilize their, their flexibility. And again, we can see that here by being able to move forward again. Which we can then fill in like so. Although that... Um, I was going to say that kind of dooms the, the purple blocks, so we need to move the, per the red block again before we can move the purple blocks. Because it seems we have more green blocks accessible on the lower side of the screen, um, what I'm going to do is bring this up like so. So that we can shift this over like that. And now we'll need to make a space to clear this. And we'll do that by shifting this over. And again, shifting this to the right. Okay. Um, now, now what? Now, we need to move those purple blocks out of the way. So, we need to create some space on the back end of things. And that... Oh no, that's not the way. That's not the way to do it. So, if I only have two empty blocks to work with, right? I'm eventually going to be able to move one of these purple blocks to the left, but I won't be able to utilize that space at all at that point. Meaning, those purple blocks are currently frozen where they are. So I need to figure out some other way before moving this red block into this position, 
how to utilize my current resources, I guess, to, to get that purple block out of the way. So let's think about how we want to do that. Hmm. How can I get that purple block out of the way? Oh, I feel like we were making such good progress. But I don't... I don't think... I think we're going to have to undo that progress and go backwards a bit. And start to cycle those purple blocks back a little bit earlier. Oh, we're so close. We were so close. But, um... But yeah, we need either blue blocks up there, or green blocks, because as long as the purple blocks are there, we can't do anything. So, yeah, we're gonna have to move, move them back. And I guess we'll send the, the blue block up, like so. And then we can, um... Bring this up, this guy up, and we'll send you back. And now, let's work on getting these purple blocks out of the way. Again, obviously not super efficient in terms of <laughs> moves, but, but we're figuring it out. We are figuring it out. Now, it, I can't utilize that lower right block right now, or can I? Mm, not particularly, and in fact, I don't like this current setup. Just because of how the, the blocks are arranged. Those green blocks are isolated up in the upper left corner. I don't like that. Let's do this. I like that a lot more. Okay. So now, I think we have a little bit more room to work with in terms of getting these blocks cycled back. So what's the first thing we want to do? Um, start to cycle them like this at least the thing is I don't think this is really that productive as you guys can probably see <laughs> um, so maybe there's a fundamental error we made early on that we can try to fix by bringing this back even more Let's really try to focus on getting one of these purple pieces behind the the princess. I know we're basically back at the beginning, <laughs> but um, I think it'll be really important to try to do that. Yeah, let's restart. Oh man, I feel like we were, I thought we were so close. I thought we were almost there, but we definitely still have some stuff to work on. And I think that thing we're going to want to work on is being able to get one of the, at, at least one of the purple blocks behind the red block. That'll be the key to getting through this. So again, our first move never changes, but I think I'm going to try and keep a little bit more conscious about where the, where the purple block is relative to the red block and trying to kind of fit it in back there.
So let's start by moving this along like so. We can bring this over. And then, um, yeah, I'd say we're doing an alright job of cycling things along. At this point, all we can really do is make room for this other purple piece. But again, I don't want them just bundled up off in that top right corner. So I, I need to make a conscious effort to not let that happen. So again, we'll move this forward, and then we can bring it back like that. That is a dead end. <laughs> I messed it up pretty sure the same way I did the very first time I, uh, I did the puzzle. So let's focus on keeping these green blocks useful. Hmm. This is the same thing! <laughs> Why did I do the same thing? <laughs> Why did I do the same thing? Um... We'll move this out of the way so this can come down, this can go this way, we can bring that forward. Like so. And again, we're going to focus on cycling. So let's bring this back even more. That's not helpful. That's not helpful. Um, yeah, this is going to lead to a dead end. Kind of wish there was an undo button. That would be really helpful for getting through this rather than having to restart every single time. But, but it's okay. I can also understand why there isn't one. Um... Hmm. I see you flashing in the corner hints <laughs> hints button. I will not I will not cave yet. So this is a pretty solid um, opening, I think, but this is a key diverging point. I need to have green blocks here if I want to be able to utilize this space after I make room for it by moving this. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. but. Yeah, so I need to have that blue block in the upper left corner there. And so then the only thing I have to fill that is that. So now it's a matter of, well, I think I actually need to start bringing this blue block down. But I can't really utilize the green blocks as much if I do that. But I think I'm going to need to eventually if I want to get that purple over. So... Yeah, this is the same situation as before. It's the same fruitless situation as before. Um, what I need to do is that. So I do need to keep that blue block in the upper left corner so I can move this back towards the center. keep things progressing, I need to bring this around. Now the question is, 
Do I bring both of those in front, like so? So that I can continue shifting things around? The thing is... Well, let's see here for a moment. I obviously have that space there. However, I may be able to utilize it if I do something like this. Like that. I don't know if I like this, guys. I don't know. Um, because we're basically going to end up undoing what we what we just did. Because I don't have a way of moving this blue block. Again, because those purple blocks are there trapping it. So. So what to do? What to do? So, at the very least, I've kind of concluded that I can't end up in a position like this. I can't cycle the blue, or not the blue, the, the purple block over this early. Because then, the only way I'm going to be able to open up space for the red block to move is going to do so in a way that the two open blocks will be trapped by both the blue block and the purple block. So this cannot be the opening. And instead, my, my purple block needs to be back here. And I will instead need to do something like this. So that once I do move this, I can indeed utilize this space. What's also interesting is that I'll never really be able to... Well, yeah, I guess, yeah, I'll... Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> uh, I've been in this situation so many times, and I'm trying to just... This green block in the corner here, if I could just free this from where it's trapped right now, it would be... it would be over. But I can't. Oh, I've tried so many times going back and forth and undoing things and, and redoing them, and... Oh, I don't see it. I don't see it. Oh man, guys, this is this is taking quite some time. <laughs> this is taking quite some time. Um, it's a good puzzle. It's a good puzzle. But oh, I feel so close, and then it's just that one isolated green block. That one isolated green block. Oh man, guys, I'm starting to forget what what was even doing what. Been at this for quite some time. Maybe time to, to step away. And I need to have dinner, but we'll see.
My goodness. <laughs> Legends Apprentice saves the day. I felt like I was gonna go crazy there. Oh my goodness. There was so much I mean I I was able to plan out the beginning moves pretty well, but but the solution at least that I was that I came up with was you have to multi you have to move the the princess forward you have to move that red block forward and then move it back to where it was multiple times just to shift pieces around the overall principle being obviously you want the green more flexible blocks to be where you can go and you don't ever want a a purple block pushed up against a blue block um, because you'll create a little vacuum with the two empty spaces but holy cow that um that took me a long time. <laughs> that took me a long time. Wonderful. <laughs> Splendid, my boy, of course. I had no doubts you could do it. Why, thank you. But, oh my goodness, that was, that was tough. And, okay, as expected, we have unlocked the Puzzle Master's house. And we have completed the Golden Apple's house. Wow. Um, my, my brain is drained after that one. I, I, <laughs> I'm sure I'll show clips of... The madness setting in uh, but um but those were good those are good uh, just to refresh the, the Queens one was awesome the heavier lighter one was awesome the the sliding one was also awesome really difficult really forces you to think about you know multiple steps ahead and and how each block can move and really good stuff sorry I got so quiet at that point I really really needed to focus to the point that I couldn't even really be explaining everything that was going on in my head. Um, it would be too distracting. And sometimes I wasn't even aware of what I was trying to process. So, yeah. Um, but nevertheless, that was that was probably my favorite house yet. The Art Lover's House had some really solid ones too. I liked that a lot. But uh, maybe not. Was it the number lock? Yeah, it was number lock. Or no, that was missing number. What was the number lock one again? Oh, no, I, li I like that one a lot. Number lock was really great. Um, the four balls one was really great. And then, yeah, the golden apple. The I loved all three of those puzzles. Good stuff. And now we are finally at the puzzle master's house. Professor Layton himself. But anyways, until the next episode, this is Moon Knight Zero. And this mission is complete.